be monitoring that chat box. So if, if you get the chat box, you just hover the mouse over the little chat thing at the bottom of the screen and you can send um, in your question and we'll try and deal with those later on. Hi folks, uh, I'll just introduce ourselves. Uh, we're Neve and Noel Richardson. Uh, we're members and coaches in Kilkenny City Harriers and have been out for, for a number of years. We coach about 25 younger athletes between say the ages of about 14 and 21. Um, our background is in kind of physical education and, and sports science exercise physiology. And so we, we bring that kind of perspective to, to our coaching. But tonight is really a bit about philosophy, a bit about psychology and a bit about uh, physiology. So we're trying to reflect really on our experiences over a number of years, both, both as athletes ourselves. We've seen the pictures there, that's from the late 1980s from the World Student Games and the Intervarsities, I think. So we, we competed for a good number of years ourselves. And we've also, as I said, been coaching now for the last kind of 10 or 15 years. So it's really to reflect on our experiences of, of both as athletes and as coaches and to share some of that with you. And we're very much going to do a double act here in and out. Um, and we just one of that picture just strikes me there. I'm looking at it of Pat Duffy on the right hand side. We have been lucky enough, I suppose, to be inspired throughout our careers by lots of great people. Pat Duffy, Liam Morgan, people that are just too many to mention. Um, so these are just personal reflections and we'd love to hear all of your reflections later on as well. So this is what we're going to try and cover. Uh, I'm going to start off with a little overview of the physiology of running, kind of understanding why we do what we do whenever we're trying to train endurance runners. And as I said, there are resource links at the end of the presentation. So we'll only be able to touch on this in the very briefest way. And I would suggest that afterwards then, there's one really good article from Runner's World that I hope you'll find useful. And we're going to look at a little short video, it's only three minutes long, and I think it'll give a really good overview of, of what we're going to talk about. And then Noel is going to follow up next with 10 lessons learned from his perspective as an athlete that he has now brought forward. And one interesting question came in from some of you beforehand saying, if you knew then what you know now, what might you have done differently? So he's going to reflect on that a little bit. And with them, we're going to talk about coaching and specifically about our experience in working with the group of young people that we work with. So let's start here. Um, so this is literally a whirlwind tour through some running physiology basics. So there's an awful lot of um, emphasis on sports science and on terminology and on technology. And it's very easy to get freaked out by it all. But really, you know, endurance running is it's fundamentally a very simple act. And I think, we, I think it's really, there's just three really important elements that we need to think about here. Um, VO2 max, which is the maximum amount of oxygen that you can, you, you can use when you run and trying to get to use the total maximum amount um, of oxygen that you can. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but the article on the next slide is really, really good if you're not too sure about what that's about. We're really going to focus in on lactate threshold work because really this is the bread and butter of an endurance run. And I think there's a lot of um, maybe misinterpretation, a lot of different terminology that we can use, but really we end up meaning the same thing. And so we're going to just use the term lactate threshold throughout all of this. It's the best physiological predictor of distance running performance. And the more, the, the, you know, your lactate threshold, it's your fastest sustainable pace, really. And the longer the race, the more important your lactate threshold is. And, you know, a few people have asked us now in COVID-19 times, what kind of training we're doing with our group. And really, it's all just below lactate threshold or nudging on lactate threshold, but not anything above that. So we're going to specifically show you this little clip about lactate threshold. Running economy, people who run more miles usually have more running, better running economy. We're not sure if it's kind of a chicken and egg situation there. Um, strength and conditioning work can really help with running economy. It improves the, the running mechanics and it can also help with injury prevention, of course. But the strength condition can be really, really useful there. So lactate threshold, running economy, arguably the most important here. And really, the most important thing is knowing what type of session you're doing and why you're doing it. And it's one thing that we always try and do with our athletes is try and help them to understand why we're doing particular sessions. So 
the handout, which is the link at the bottom of this slide, is really, really good from Runner's World. Lovely and simple, and it describes the three main parts of the pie quite simply and gives you some ideas about what kinds of sessions you know you can use to try and uh, work on the different elements. This nice little three minute explanation is, is I hope useful in trying to describe what threshold pace is or what a lactate threshold session is. Sometimes people call it maximal lactate steady state. It doesn't really matter what you call it, we're going to just call it a threshold or lactate threshold. So let's have a look and see does this work. Just loading here. You got to go and tell the family to stay off Netflix and to <laughs> do all those things. Just mute that. Mm -hmm. Focus on tempo runs or lactate threshold training. And I want to kind of focus in on the specific intensity or pace that you're going to run these workouts at, and then also give you some real life examples that you could use in your training. What I will not talk about in this video are physiological things like exponential lactate curves, hydrogen ions, and sodium bicarbonate buffering. So a lot of times different coaches or different training programs will kind of just throw out all these different terms. It'll be tempo runs, lactate threshold, threshold training, uh, anaerobic conditioning. And a lot of times people get kind of confused from that. Um, but essentially those terms all kind of refer to the same pace range. It's kind of the same training stimulus. So in this video, I'm going to say tempo run or lactate threshold. And it's essentially going to mean the same thing. So... Forgive me if I use them interchangeably. To quantitatively define this pace range, you're working at basically 80 to 90% of your VO2 max, or about 85 to 90% of your maximum heart rate. Now, if you're like me, you don't really have a chance to go to the lab and get these tested. So you have to go more by feel and by recent race performances. Um, if you look at, if you've ever run a 15K race, that is the pace that is really close to your lactate threshold. If you haven't run a 15K, you could look at your 10K road pace or track pace and add about 10 to 15 seconds a mile. So it's kind of a pace range in between your half marathon race pace and your 10K race pace. And that's going to vary depending a little bit on the weather and how you feel on a particular day. So it's, it's kind of an art and a science to zero in on that specific pace that's going to give you the best stimulus of training your lactate threshold. So a lot of runners, myself included, run these tempo runs at a too high of an intensity. We run them way too fast. We're kind of overachievers. And if you basically find yourself running so hard that you can only mutter single syllable words, perhaps expletives, or if you start tasting the metallic, any like copper, whatever taste of lactic acid accumulating in the bloodstream, you're probably running too hard. Uh, you got to see that for your max workouts or anaerobic capacity workouts. Sorry, so, Neve. I think that it, video and sound are actually breaking up there. It's not working. In control, and that's no, I don't think it's it's showing the 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 sound. Okay, there. That's fine. Okay. It's not showing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Could people hear it? Yeah, we can hear. Just can't see the video. Okay. Poor that's dog. okay. That's right. Okay. Um, you can you could be able to watch that in your own time then. And let's get out of that then. Oops. Okay. Well, when I started good. writing about my travel experience, well, we get out before we go into the next one. Okay, sorry about that, folks. You, you couldn't, uh, I, could, I couldn't manage to see the comments while that was on. And um, so we, we just kind of, we'll just go straight in then, Noel, to your piece here. Yeah, so uh, one of the things we said we'd do was I'm going to reflect on some of kind of the lessons I learned as, as an athlete. 
And um, there's a lot of things I did wrong during my running career, but there was one kind of purple patch in particular that's outlined on your screen now in, in 1992, between May and December during that year, where I ran personal best uh, at every distance from 1,500 to half marathon. So I think it's actually useful, maybe more useful to think about, you know, when somebody gets things or does something well and, and to draw out some of the key learnings from that. So just a few key things to say at the outset. My training that summer was geared towards 10,000 meters, but I still ran personal best at 1,500 and 3,000. So I think that was kind of interesting. That, that kind of strength and like the threshold work that, that Neve talked about really pay dividends even at the shorter distances. And um, the other thing that I think is really important to say was the scale of improvement. I was 27 at that stage in 1992. And I, I was at a, a stage in my career where you might think, well, you know, it's, it's leveling off or plateauing. But I still had hugely significant improvements in personal best times. So there's a, there's a message there as well that you know that, that people come through at different stages at different times, and you know, not not to be kind of jumping to conclusions that somebody hasn't got there by by by, by say eighteen or twenty or something. Um, and the other thing to take from that was was the consistency throughout that season. So I ran three ten ten thousand meters on the track that summer, that were spaced out over two or three months, but like the times were relatively similar across the three. So the work I had done paid dividends in terms of maintaining a level of consistency that wasn't really apparent for most of my career. So um, just to kind of talk then a little bit about some of the kind of key ingredients that, that helped me to achieve that jump in performance and to maintain that consistency over, over, the, over the year and to do well at distances from 1500 meters up to the half marathon. A lot of it I would put down to the kind of lactate threshold work that Neve mentioned there. And the key, kind of key stable ingredients for that, and this can be tailored obviously for younger athletes with much lower volume, um, but there, there were kind of three elements. One were, were, were kind of longer sessions that were below lactate threshold pace. So I was lucky enough at that point to get tests done in the lab um, in Limerick or in, in Belfast. I got the tests done regularly, so I knew exactly where my lactate threshold was. And typically it was in the low 170s. So my longer sessions like five and six mile tempo runs or three by two miles were done at a controlled steady pace below lactate threshold. Then shorter intervals like say mile intervals or kilometer intervals were done roughly at lactate threshold pace. And then some shorter efforts like 400 meters with short recoveries or like sustained hills were done at or just above lactate threshold pace. Um, so like these kind of six benchmark sessions would have been spaced out over three weeks. I would have done two, uh, two of those sessions, uh, like generally a longer one and a shorter one each week. And I maintained those kind of sessions over a long period of time and they paid dividends when, when it came to um, races and, and, and achieving consistency over that summer. So what kind of, just to kind of succinctly then say what kind of key lessons I learned that I think are, are applicable as for, for coaches especially who might be listening the first thing i think is to say is if at first you don't succeed you know that, that was really important for me so 27 years of age i shouldn't have been getting kind of pbs of a you know a minute a minute and a half over 10,000 or 25 seconds over 5,000 but i did you know so like we, we, sometimes we can label and judge younger athletes too early and, and don't give them the kind of time for them to come through the way we should and our philosophy as coaches is to nurture the kind of sense of team and the love for the sport and fun. And all those things are really important. And as we, as we show from case studies with the younger athletes later, like the performances can come later. You know? So the first thing is to is just develop a culture and an environment that's fun and that's enjoyable and allow the, allow the, the performances to come later. The second thing I think is that there is no substitute for, for hard work. I'm, I'm struck by a video I saw of Brother Colum, who's worked with all the great Kenyan athletes a number of years ago. And he's standing looking over them training down in a kind of a, a track. And, and he, said, he was asked, like, what's the secret of the Kenyan success? And his answer, of course, was there is no secret. It's just hard work. I mean, look at all the great kind of teams like Barcelona or I worked with the Kenny Hurling team for a number of years. I mean, it, it is, there is no substitute for hard work. And as, as a grafter myself, as an athlete, I'm, I kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm really appealed to that kind of way of thinking. Um, the third thing is to, is to dream big and don't set limits on performance. 
So I went into 1992, um, having run 13.50s for 5K. Um, I hadn't broken uh, 29.30 for 10K. But yet I went in kind of dreaming and hoping I might make the Olympics. I didn't make the Olympics as it turned out, but got actually quite close to over 5K. So it's really important to, you know, to, to actually not set limits on performance. I used to have a poster in my bedroom. Um, it was a Nike ad. Um, in my mind, I'm a Kenyan was the slogan. And uh, so I, I think it's good to kind of not set limits and to, and to dream of, of what you can, can, can do. Um, I can't use bad language on, 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 on webinars. I might never get hired back by AI, but this is borrowed from Brendan Hackett, a sports psychologist. And I think it's really important. It's to kind of challenge that voice in your head that tells you you're no good some of the time, and some athletes more, more than others. And interesting enough, one of the questions that came in was, you know, how do you, how do you cater for kids who get really nervous before races? And I think it's, there's four or five things that I would really stress as being important. The first is, is to normalize nerves. You know, nerves are what, what gets us into the zone to perform really well. So kids shouldn't, shouldn't think that nerves are a bad thing. Nerves are really good to get us to perform to a high level. The problem is obviously when it gets kind of over over a certain a certain kind of stress level. The second thing is with kids is, is to work with them and find out well when if they cope well with races or with nerves. So and work on those things. So maybe it's a particular routine they follow, or maybe it's not hanging around with other actors who might also be nervous. So really get at get at what's worked well with them in the past and build a strategy in, in dealing with nerves around that. Um it's really important to talk about nerves, not to do so like on the Friday night before a race on Sunday. So do it in the calm of, of midweek or two weeks before a race where there's no real stress at that point. So, and talk it through with them. Don't, don't avoid it. Talk it through and, and ask them, you know, what is it that, that's bothering them and try and work with them. Um, a really important thing, I think, is, is to have a kind of a strategy on race day and take control of all the things you can take control of. So making out a kind of checklist of things you can do for yourself and not be worried about, you know, the conditions or the opposition or the weather or whatever else. And, and finally, I, we always say to our athletes, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? And when you think about it, like, you know, losing a race it certainly isn't the worst thing that can happen. So, you know, get them to kind of relax more about it and not to get overly stressed. Um, a key, key learning point we have, uh, we have got from over the years is, is to invest in a strong base to achieve peak performance. So I kind of alluded to that, that earlier when I talked about running PBs at shorter distances, even though I hadn't really focused on those things. But when you invest in, in good strength and endurance work and, and lack of threshold work, it's not all about running fast 400s or 200s. It really is about investing in, in, in a good base. Um, one, someone asked, you know, what would you do differently over, over looking back in your career? This is the area I would really change, uh, recovery. And a friend of mine, Jeremy Gow, was talking about his rest day being the most important session of the week, which I think is really interesting. But all the other aspects of recovery, like um, you know, getting good sleep, good hydration, good nutrition, foam rolling, stretching, you know, having periods of you know, recovery weeks or an easy week interspersed with two or three hard weeks, all those things are critically important. So the, the worst mistake you can make is to try and get to your objective too quickly. Steady as you go is the, is the, is the name of the game. Um, find a good coach is really important. In fact, any coach is better than no coach because as athletes, we tend to get a bit sort of too deeply involved. We don't see the wood from the trees. So it's really important that there's an objective perspective to look in on what you're doing and to see red flags when, when they appear and, and to kind of pull you back if need be. Um, a key learning I've had over the years is if you, if you do the same thing all the time, you get the same results. I remember once I, I, was, I was in the army at the time and I worked in Port Leash Prison and I could only run around this really small kind of area of about 150 metres. So I was doing laps and laps like this all the time. So I ended up doing sessions of things like 40 by 50 metres with short recoveries and ended up running unbelievably well when I came out of there. And the, the mistake I made was I didn't really recognize the, the advantage of, of changing things up. But the lesson there is that when you shock your body into doing something different, it adapts and responds much better. So by doing the same thing all the time, your body gets stale and doesn't adapt and improve the way, the way it might. And planning is really important. And this is where a coach comes in as well. So it's really important to know what you're doing next week, next month, and next year. And as I said, it's not all about getting, getting results in the short term. It's about building for the future. 
and this is where a coach can work with you and, and have a periodized plan of action to, to, you know, to, to improve incrementally and steadily. And finally, don't take yourself too seriously. I've, I've seen so much of this over the years, you know, in all sorts of sports. When you get to a point in your career where you, can, where you relax more and you're not getting, getting too caught up or head up about things, that's when performance can really improve and, and you can really push on. So like the more a group environment has kind of fun and, and uh, distractions from the seriousness of competition, the better. And it's really important to kind of have a relaxed perspective insofar as is possible. And going on that, the group side of things, we're going to just focus in now on our group. And this is a, one of the pictures of our, few pictures of our group. So this is a quote from Marcus O'Sullivan who, from the Irish Examiner last year. Everyone spends too much time on the athletic procedure, you know, the, the sessions, what sessions are you doing and so on? How many miles are you doing? And doesn't take enough time to consider the environment, the attitude, the psychological approach. And we were lucky enough to meet Marcus recently when he was home and just shoot the breeze with him for a while. And he's just an absolutely inspirational guy and um, looking for people Absolutely. who have him as a coach. But, you know, he really was, was focusing in on this. So we, we try really to take this on board. And we're also very lucky in Kilkenny. We have the Castle Park on our doorstep and we use it all the time. All through September, we get our training. We only have 50 minutes in there because everybody's at school and everything, but we just make the most of that 50 minutes and it's, it's worth it for the soul to be in there. We're very, very lucky. And then across the road from the Castle Park is the Kilkenny Design Centre. And you know, we try and do just regular little things with the group, just small stuff. This is just a, a coffee at Christmas. We didn't do, go out for any fancy dinners or anything. We just went for, went for coffee and had a, had a bit of crack. Um, and we do, we do that a lot. And this is just a trip that we went on down to Curraclo. And you can see there just by the slight different sizes and everything that we have kids from 14, 15 up to all the college kids when they come back at the weekend, they join in with us as well. We have some people from other clubs who come and join us occasionally as well. Um, so they are very used to training in a group and I know we're lucky to have that group and that group ebbs and flows a bit we have a, a lot of pe new people who just come into it with lots of different um, ability levels in the group but it's fine it's absolutely no problem really to try and work with a, a mixed group in, in training and of course they really miss this now now during the COVID-19 times it's it's hard for everybody and, and they're they're really missing this group side of things they're not the only ones I was when I saw this yesterday Coral Kipchoge is finding it really hard to train alone as well, so uh, maybe feel a bit better. So it, it, it's not new. Okay, so um, we, we, I'll pass over to Noel now in just a second on, on this one, but this, this quote here, I know it was probably Albert Einstein who, who, who said it, but anyway, we think Liam Moggins, grandfather from Fiona Glasha, uh, said it as well. Um, so not everything is countable. So what is it about the group that matters or that counts? Uh, and I suppose we should ask the athletes about that, but, and we do sometimes, but so it's not just about the training. Um, both of us are there with the group, probably 80, 85% of the time. Um, sometimes one or other of us can't be there for work or whatever it may be. So it does help that it, one of us might be doing whatever with the group and then the other person can check in with different individuals um, at different times. So we do have a group ethos and very much a group approach but we hope that we get time to give them all individual time as well. Um, and just, just to add to that, like it's not all about spending like a half an hour with an athlete. Sometimes it could be just like on a warm up on a jog, like a check in for like 10 seconds. Um, and that, that's enough, you know, and, and doing that regularly is nearly more important than having kind of extended conversations with as well. And you've mentioned the group there, like we, we try and instill a kind of level of independence and autonomy in the group. So like we, we do like mobilizations and warm-ups with them, but then over time they take on that role themselves. And mostly one of, at least one of us is at the training sessions, but sometimes we, we might both be away. And we're, we're lucky to call on some of the senior athletes in Kilkenny that, that, that come in and help out the likes of Toss Hayes and Brian Maher and Owen Everett and these guys who have been really great over the years in support supporting us in, in, in that. Um, but I mean, they would also say that, that when they come in, like the, the, thing, the life goes on and the, the guys know what they're doing and they get on with it. So that level of sense of responsibility and autonomy and taking control of it is really important. So, you know, so, that, so it's not about if the coach is not there, it's all going to kind of cave in. It's nothing like that. I mean, the, the athletes are very self-directed and 
take responsibility for themselves. Yeah. One question came in actually from somebody about, you know, what's it like coaching a family member? We have several of our family members um, in, as, as in our group. Um, so I asked my 21 year old, our 21 year old family member, and asked, and she said, well, she said, well, it's always up to, it was always up to us. So no, it, it isn't an issue. And she said, maybe it was when I was about 11 or when I was messing around and all of that, but now not, not in the least. So um, I don't, it doesn't really, it's not really an issue, I, I don't think, um, for us in, in our group. But yeah, we obviously don't treat them any differently, you know, so it's, it's fine. Yeah. We did, like an interesting example a couple of years ago where our third daughter finished fourth in the All-Ireland Schools, 1,500 metres, and her teammate from KCH finished third. And her teammate was, was quite upset because she, you know, she, she didn't, she, I don't know, she thought because we were Ella's parents that we were going to be upset with her for getting third. So it's really, really funny. But it, like it, it, obviously that wasn't the case and we didn't see any as being any different to Ella. So yeah, so parents doesn't, doesn't matter in my view. Yeah. Just one last thing on that slide was about, about them having to take charge of a, a lot of what goes on in the session and it's, 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 it's a nice atmosphere because of that. Um, but the, they also have to be proactive with injuries. They need to tell us if they're tired from playing some other sport or if they've been niggle. And we're all, we always are on the side of caution. Um, we nearly always train on grass and we've taught all of them how to pool run um, and with proper technique. So they know that if they get injured, or not, not even if they're injured, if there's some, some doubt at all, in they go into the pool, do their pool running. They can maintain completely their, their fitness in there. And we're very lucky to have Claire Lodge, who her um, kids have been in, involved with the group, and she's just amazing. She's been there and, and has been so generous with her time. She's a physiotherapist. So I think we probably dealt with most of the top ones. We won't kind of yeah, we've, we've done the Algarve Easter camp last year, and oh, we're yeah. planning to go again this year. But unfortunately, coronavirus put, put pay to that. But that, that was a really that was great fun, really yeah. great trip, and at fairly low cost. It's, it's something that other clubs might want to consider. Um, accommodation was twelve or thirteen euros a night, I think. Yeah, and flights if you book them well in advance are, are not not that expensive. So yeah. it's really good. We might just deal with these things about other sports and growth sports. Um, I know it's a really common one for an awful lot of us in athletics. And here in Kilkenny, you know, hurling is, is king. And we do have the same issues as everyone else um, when kids are, often kids who are great at lots of different sports and they're pulled every which way. So we just welcome them in saying, come on in, that's fine. If you can make once a week, if you can make once every two weeks, come anyway. Um, and we usually are the ones who are pulling back um, but if they are doing other sports, um, yeah, we'd, we'd, often ch we'd often chat to the parent, parents, and then say, work, work back in a week. So if a child has two or three sports, to say to the parent, like the, the, the most they can train or compete in the week is four or five times. And that, that, like that's an awful lot even at that. But, but like sometimes that there would be an expectation if they were to, if they were to do, deliver on all the sports that they'd be out every night. So we'd say to them, look, say four times a week, that's the max. So the most they can do the sport is once a week and so take take the onus away from the child you know make the put it on the parent to kind of deal with the coaches and the other sports make sure they're not being over overtaxed okay so we, we just thought we'd finish up here and um, we'll only be another five minutes a little case study on three of the athletes in our group so uh peter lynch eva richardson and shay mcavoy and there's just some pictures here and this is a quote from Brian Marr, who's in our club, and he says, you know, the fastest way to good shape is slowly. And all three of these athletes have come through slowly. In this picture here is Geraldine Nolan, who we're have, lucky to have in our club as well. And Geraldine was coaching with us for many years as well. Um, and we, you know, the role modelling that everybody has seen through Geraldine, through Brian, has, I, I, we probably will talk about that a little bit later as well. Maybe. Absolutely, and Geraldine has been a phenomenal influence on in the club. Yeah. And you've mentioned Brian Maher there, I don't know if people know Brian Maher, but like he's, Brian's got great wisdom and he's such a great mentor for younger athletes as well, so we're really lucky to have people like them. So, I'm not going to read through all of this. You can just take a little minute to, to take a look at them there. And, yeah. and just, uh, there's a couple of points here that, not, none of the three athletes, when they were 12 or 13, you wouldn't have looked at them and said, they're, they're really going, they're going to be on the European cross-country team in 2019. 
um, but all of them were. In fact, in, fact, in 2011, Peter was under, under 15 and Eva was under 16 and they both finished 65th in the, in the National Cross Country Championships. Yeah. Uh, at the same age, um, Shay was 33rd. So it goes back to the point I made earlier about like people coming through at different stages and not forcing agendas. Um, and the other side of that is, in our view, like that there, if kids are winning, say, all Ireland cross country championships at 13, 14, it does put a, put a lot of responsibility on their shoulders as, as young athletes. And it's not to say that they, they won't come through, and there's lots of examples of kids who do come through as well who, who are winning younger, but it's just something to be mindful of. So if they come through a little bit later, it gives them that bit more time to mature and to cope with the stresses of, of being successful, you know, in the sense of winning or, be, or being up in, in, in the first few. Yeah. Um, uh, that's just a picture of the, of the European cross country, um, which was wonderful in Lisbon. Um, so obviously the, the Lisbon trip was a, a wonderful day, absolutely fantastic. But, you know, the following week we were up in Dundalk and there was the uneven ages juvenile cross country. There's a picture of Kevin in the club who was um, 17 on the day. Yeah. Um, and then that's Grace, our daughter there, 22nd in the intervarsities. Each of those days were great days too. So we, we try as much as possible that, you know, it's not about always about medals. It's lovely when, especially when that team, Kevin's team got second on that day and they were delighted with the team medal. Um, and, you know, it's naive to say that it, it doesn't matter where you finish because it does. And, but it's, it's, it's very much on an individual level. And it's about trying to, each for each athlete to try and, get the best out of themselves and try and progress that and we try as best we can to try and have that as our as our baseline or, or get them to have that as their benchmark one, one thing i think in athletics that we don't do enough of is to counter the argument that athletics is an individual sport mm -hmm. so like kenny all the time like it's such a hurling tradition there's lots of other team sports as well i've often heard parents say well you know i like them doing athletics but i'd like them to have a team sport as well so it's really interesting that perception that, that athletics is, is a kind of a, a lonely kind of soul or, you know, individual type sport where if you, if, you, if you go back to some of the things we talked about earlier, but having the fun, the group outings and focusing on team and cross country and that kind of thing, you know, it is very much about the team. And it's really important to emphasize that, I think, more as, as coaches. Yeah. And I was, I was just thinking, I was doing a different thing in, in my day work earlier on uh, it was about evaluation in, in health promotion and public health and it's just a really good quote it said don't let the enemy sorry don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and you know we would often love to do more with the group we'd love to maybe be able to do an extra session a week and where we do a strength conditioning or maybe do some physiological testing with them or, or whatever but we just don't have the capacity so we're only two people and we're doing it part-time so we don't beat ourselves up about that we just kind of go well look we're doing what we can we're doing maybe the best we can with the time we have um so it's it's just worth thinking about that really if you can create an atmosphere that hopefully people will love it and that's probably the most important thing especially at the moment with the COVID-19 thing um, is that we'd hope that the athletes will still be running because they love it because they want to run and they, they, they want to, to, to keep on going at it. So finishing up, this is our last picture. <laughs> that might be somebody from the Goyle Skull in Kilkenny big, doing a big cheer there. Um, but this is a picture from the Goyle Skull in Kilkenny after he came back from the European cross country and it was just phenomenal. I was bawling crying in there. It was she just was a fantastic. People, yeah. Um and I just remember Ella, one of my other daughters, going off to school dressed up as Joanne Cuddy one time because they had to go in as a their hero. Uh, Joanne Joanne Cuddy is a, a, a team mm -hmm. uh, yeah an Olympian and a, a KCH team member also. Um so I, I, I really think it matters at, at this age that maybe kids can say, oh do you know I, I get it's not just about the hurlers coming in with their uh, All Ireland trophy. Uh, and Eva, who, who you saw in an earlier picture there, when Sonia won 5,000 in the World Championships in 95, I think it was, Eva was, oh, she, 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 she was very small, and, uh, but she was doing laps of her sitting room for the entire duration of the race. So like the, the heroes and the role models are, are just so important. So we're, gonna, we're going to actually leave it there. Um, this is just our summary. This is some of the things that we kind of talked about. Uh, 
the, the, you know, everybody is equally important in the group and it's about edging forward and everybody making their own incremental improvements. And we're just going to stop there for questions and for comments. On the next slides, um, I will scoop, the, there's, there's links to Eva and Peter's reflections on what they liked as a young athlete and their reflections on their way that they came through. A really nice clip about Brother Colm, some, some words of wisdom there that you might want to talk see when he's talking about the Kenyans. And then some examples of different kind of workouts there that you might find um, interesting and useful. So I'll just stop sharing my screen now and maybe we'll uh, get to, to some questions. That, that was great, Steve. No, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I suppose we've, we've had a few questions just popping in there as, as you were speaking along. So I'll just uh, ask just a couple of them. Um, just in terms of growth spurts, and I know you touched on it there a bit, would you have any more advice in terms of dealing with um, obviously athletes that might be experiencing uh, growth spurts or that? Um, yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we would see that. We'll, we'll just think of, let's think of two of the lads. They must have grown a foot nearly, not a foot. Um, can you hear me there? So your speaker is not working. It's coming up here. Can you hear me okay, John? Yeah, we can all hear you okay. Or no, you've just changed it there. Now you might need to change back. Yeah, that's it. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's a really common thing. And they are often go through a period of being absolutely exhausted. That would be our experience. So it's just about kicking back and let it happen, really, and keep enjoying it. And I, th I think it, it can be a bit demoralizing as well for, for a kid when they are going through a, a period of growth. Um, and it's they're, maybe they're not they, they're not going as well as they were before, and I think it can be a really really difficult one. So so long as they keep enjoying it, it's it's all about enjoyment as far as we're concerned. If they if they're coming because their friends are going, and if they're they do it at the level they can, they can and we try and chat to them. Just one. Yeah, I think the key is to pull back, and the education was one of the things up earlier. So just to explain the huge demands that this growth sport is placing on their bodies, and and the, it's competing for nutrition and you know other, other things they like to, to fuel this growth spurt yeah but like something has to give you know and very often it's running so um and just to explain that it's temporary you know that, that, that like it will pass and that, that your body will grow into itself um but sometimes you can even see it in terms of, of coordination and balance like the running stride is all over the place you know it's, it's really yeah. you say funny it's not funny but yeah. um but just give it time and be patient and, and reassurance is really important. Yeah. And I suppose on, on that kind of a, a theme as such and in terms of placing demands on athletes, um, how do you, would you get an athlete to compete, obviously, when the other sports from time to time tend to be prioritised? Is there any tips or advice in terms of encouraging athletes maybe to, to compete at certain events or certain levels? Yeah, this is, this is a really interesting one because the... the there's so many things on the calendar as well. So what we would try and do is try and treat the, the athletics competition calendar as a menu rather than, you know, something that we have to get athletes out at for all the time. So we, we try and say, well, especially when we try and prioritise the team stuff. So if there's a team, especially in cross country, they're way more likely to turn up and they're, they're part of that team. Um, and also, if, if we can just prioritise and ask them to pick and help them help them to pick which ones that would be the ones that they might do and again I think I know it sounds like a broken record here but if it, it is about enjoyment and if they are likely to be traveling to it with their friends who are also on the squad I think they're more likely to go and I think it's good to negotiate these things earlier in the season so like in September to get sit, sit the kids down and say look just the deal here is that you run at least one of the county cross one of the championships you know to support your club and like, like to treat it with respect, you know, that it's no different to being part of a, a hurling team or a soccer team, that the club deserves this level of loyalty or commitment, as it were. But, but getting a balance then, as Neve says, with not kind of turning up because there's something on every other weekend. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Of other, other, obviously, if there's hurling matches or soccer matches or other things, then we, we just don't, we can't be... Yeah. And another question there, I suppose, when, when you do manage to get the athletes to the, the, the competitions, um, just in terms of dealing with uh, extreme, extreme race or performance anxiety, would you have any tips or advice in, in how to deal with that? 
Yeah, and we've, we've had a good bit of experience of this, even with our own, one of our own girls really just paralyzed her, has par been paralyzed with it. Um, and I, I think it's about trying to work on it over a long period of time. Um, probably one of the best people I saw working with a group of our group of athletes one time was Brendan Hackett. Noel mentioned him earlier on and he was super with them, but it, it was that thing. Say F off to that voice in your head. Um, and to, to say to, to, you've got to practice it it's like it's like any other part of the routine but when you're really really stressed it's not the best time to be practicing it and just to reiterate i, I don't know if everyone got this earlier but i think some some athletes some younger athletes think that they're the only ones that are nervous you know and that, that everyone else is fine and i'm the only one that's nervous so just to reassure them that it's part and parcel of you know for everyone except some people just experience it a bit more than others and also then to say that like it's it, it's it is also an aid to performing well. So by by being nervous, it gets you into kind of a higher zone in terms of performance wise. So so to see it as something positive, and then to harness it rather than to let it kind of paralyze you. Um, and the other couple of things to mention then, like the, the day of a race or, or the, the Friday night before the Sunday, is not the time to be dealing with it. The time to de deal with it is on a leisurely midweek day well away from competition and to get the athlete talking about it um, and i always think like if you work start the starting point is where if they've had a good an example where they've really conquered the nerves and to, to find out well, what did you do that day you know what was your routine like before the race how did you how did you manage to get on top of it that day and not other days and to try and recreate that kind of build up and those strategies as part of their normal race routine then I think that's really helpful and really important. One other small thing that we did as well with uh, one particular athlete was so I said let's let's take one race where it, it doesn't matter where on or never you know it really doesn't matter where you finish and your only job today is to try and control your nerves nothing else don't let it try and stay as calm as as, as you possibly can and then afterwards then we're just reflecting did you enjoy that yeah and you know what, what did you do differently um and, and but to walk through every little detail of what they did did and could you try and replicate that so it's it's about i think it's about practicing it and about being really honest and talking it through in detail last year one of one of the best things we did actually when we went to the algarve was we spent a lot of time um talking about this very thing people were really frank about it yeah they really really start talking and, we, then, we, and then we broke them into much smaller groups and we, we continued um to talk about it especially with people who were really struggling with it and I do think it's a good, it is one of the reasons why a lot of kids drop out. They get mm. so paralyzed. I suppose there's, a, there's actually a question there that I suppose is, is, is down that line of things as well. In terms of when athletes get to that 15, 16 years of age, do your, do your, your own club have any kind of tips or advice in terms of holding on to those athletes when, when they reach that age? Um, we've just tried to, um, I mean, there's no, no doubt about it. There's a huge, you know, drop off. Um, but we've really tried, we've worked hard on trying to, um, have, have enough to want them to keep on coming. So, um, you know, the, the little social things that we do. So we try at the, in, when everybody gets back training in September, and especially when you're getting into that cross country season and everything, which we, we try and regularly punctuate uh, what we do with, um, whether it's just a cup of coffee after training sometimes in a, in a bun or or we go down to Dummer East and train down there for the day and we might go on the bouncy yoke in the water or we do just stuff like that. Um, just to try and do something different about Greg Man another time. Do little yeah. things. Um, and, and just try and have a bit of crack alongside the athletics. But you, you can't force an athlete yeah. to stay. So um, I think all you can do is create the environment where it's welcoming and fun and enjoyable and where there isn't that there isn't any massive pressure for them to you know be someone else or compete at certain things um, and our experience actually is that some of the other sports are much more dictatorial you know they're kind of saying well unless if you miss a session you're off a panel or whatever um, and that wouldn't be our philosophy so we keep encouraging kids to come once a week or if they miss a couple of months they're welcome to come back and pick up where they left off so like I think if you if you if you respect the person, including 
children, I think it'll, it'll bear dividends in the longer run. Yeah, we've had a couple of kids in the group who said, oh, I, I, I'm not competing anymore. And we just said, Grant, come, come anyway if you want to come. And we won't pr put pressure on you to compete. And they've come back, though. a couple of them have come back. I'm just thinking of my own daughter. Mm. You know, that ha does happen sometimes. Sometimes it mightn't, but, you know, it's that's okay by us. Perfect. Um, I think we've covered a lot of the kind of similar vein of question that's, that's coming in there at the minute. So we might just finish on the, the last question. So just someone asking there in terms of if an athlete was looking to, to find a coach or that, who should they or what should they be asked if they were, they were looking to find a coach? Uh, first of all, yeah, through your club, um, if there isn't a club. And then um, or see if there is a club in your area who you could talk to. Um, I presume it's through the club system is the best way to do it. Um, well, some people, you know, sometimes it happens where you might have, you know, in a, in a rural area, you might just have two kids and there mightn't be enough people for a group. And maybe if there was a group nearby that you could join in with, you know, a club, I think it has to be through the club situation, really. Yeah, club was word of mouth. If you, you know, if you're, you know, somebody else who's, who's got a good experience of working with a, with a, a particular coach you might you might get a recommendation you know that that way but i think through the club structure is a good way and, and the other thing is like if you if you, work, if you start to work with the coach and, and it doesn't work out like there's always the option to yeah, yeah. you're not going to them or anything you know so <laughs> and obviously we'd, we'd encourage anyone to contact any of our local region development officers who'd be able to obviously <laughs> offer any advice or, or guidance that they need so and um, look Noel and Eve, that's been absolutely brilliant and um, i think i speak for everyone that we've put on mute there over the last 45 minutes that would say uh, thanks very much uh, i think we, we all learned a lot and uh Look, we'll, be, we'll obviously be sharing the video on our YouTube channel over the next day or two, and we can also forward the slides to anyone that would uh, like us to forward the slides as well. Great. Take care, folks. Take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning Bye in. now. Off Bye. a glass of wine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hi, Lillian. Bye. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye, John. Thanks for that, guys. See you, folks. Thanks very much. That was really good. Thank you. Thanks, William. That was great. Thank you. Bye, bye, Solomonish. Um, a coaching seminar.